How's it going, everybody? This is Dailies to Downloads. We are back with the conclusion to our series of shows on documentaries. There are still some we haven't covered. Can you believe that, Eric? Uh, I mean, I, wait till we get to nonfiction books. Are they documentaries? Discuss. Right. I mean, you know, like <laughs> sure somebody will call it that. Like you were saying last week, I think we're both more confused now than when we we were when we started this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you actually try to break it down, it actually makes you more confused, unfortunately. Yeah, well, we'll talk about all the all the terms here and uh, what we think about them at the end. Uh, as you can see, Tom is with us. I'm thinking about replacing Eric with Tom because uh, yeah. if Eric doesn't get that facial hair and, and you then, know under control, we might have to think about switching co-hosts. So I'm going for the, the castaway look. <laughs> um, you know six months into didn't he have to go away for six months to like lose all that weight and grow all that hair and everything right so something like that but you know what yeah. how, how about this i'll let you keep it if you learn how to uh you know catch a fish by just throwing a spear across a uh, body of water that's good yeah. i thought you were gonna ask me to take out a tooth with a ice skate or whatever <laughs> whatever he does in that movie <laughs> I don't that too that too would work yeah he does that as well thanks <laughs> all right so we are going to go over some of the smaller subgenres of documentaries here. We're gonna go through them uh, a little bit quicker than we would with some of the other ones because a lot of these, there's really not much to some of these categories. We're going to start with compilation films and these also are known as expository documentaries. They often have voiceovers and a strong point of view goes along with them. They're often rhetorical and aim to persuade the viewer of something, uh, usually, the filmmaker will use pictures, images to advance an argument, and they want you to look at those images in a certain way. And, you know, when we're talking about historical documentaries of this category, uh, they deliver an objective account or an interpretive interpretation of past events. So one of the mainstays of compilation films, Eric, is obviously Ken Burns. And you and I have had conversations in the past about Ken Burns. I know you're not as big of a fan of him as I am. I will just say uh, on my end that I, I, he's definitely one of my heroes in terms of filmmaking. And the reason is, and now his style, obviously, if anybody has seen some of his movies, uh, The Civil War or Baseball or the two most popular ones, you know, they are long. They are often, it's a very simplistic style. Uh, one thing I do not like about Ken Burns is the fact that whenever I'm using iMovie, I have to yeah, yeah. deal with the Ken Burns effect, yeah. even if I don't want to. But yeah. that's not what this podcast is, or rather this show is about. So, but yes, yeah, so I, I'm a big fan of Ken Burns because I think that his style is proof that you don't need to manipulate footage that much. I'm not saying he hasn't done that in any of his documentaries. Certainly, I'm sure he has. But you can choose, you can do it in a simple way. You can approach it using a very unfashionable, you know, sort of, you know, attitude. And you can simply put some music there, put some images, tell a story, and you can have people engage. Now, obviously, you know, everybody has their opinions on whether or not his movies are all engaging. But that's why I like him. And, you know, that's, he's certainly a big part of this style of documentary and, and he's not the only one there are lots of filmmakers out there anything you've watched on the history channel stuff like that um so eric what do you think uh ken well, burns well well one thing I, I wonder just by like the description of the compilation doc if you, if you will like i actually don't i i wonder if i would put ken burns in that um distinction just because it's not i don't and again i may be a little uh hazy on the exact definition but I, but but listening from what you just said too it's just like i've seen some documentaries that are like completely found archival material you know right. and in the con in the context is kind of just comes about by the editing and stirring of them together like a mo you know big montage kind of thing whereas i feel like ken burns is not that you know like they're still usually talking heads um kind of giving context and then there there will be still photographs or, or things True. like that. Right? And, and oftentimes he does have talking heads. Now in some of, the, yeah. some of them he doesn't, but, uh, and I should add that the reason I mentioned Ken Burns in this category is because if you looked at, you know, the Wikipedia article 
about compilation films, it, it did list him under it. That's why he, he was yeah. mentioned in this case. But no, you make a good point, though. Uh, you know, when when you think of like a compilation film, it would might be more of what you said, which is like a archival footage compiled into yeah. into one thing. Whereas, you know, Ken Burns certainly does compile photographs and into one thing. It's a little it is different, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I, I was thinking um, for me, a big one was like the Atomic Cafe, which was in like in the early 80s. And that was from the like the Cold War nuclear warfare era and like kind of putting together like clips and news clips and commercials and, and um, you know, morning, daytime infomercial stuff and things like that all from that period. Right. Or um, our our Nixon, which was another one, which was all 16 millimeter footage that was shot during Nick's, Richard Nixon's presidency in the White House and footage that had never been released before. And it was kind of right. put, you know, put together and, you know, spruced up and put together, but really not adding uh, additional context to it. Again, there's something to be said about the way it's put together, but uh, it, it doesn't have a, a voice coming on from the present, you know? Right. Um, then there, there's, there's also one that I had, I had never seen before, which was uh, from Joe Dante, who I made, mean, you know, Gremlins and all these things. Back in the 60s, he had one called The Movie Orgy, which I, I believe, do you remember, have you heard of that? I, I, I have not. I would have remembered a title like that, but that is, I that, well, it I, <laughs> it's it's not what you know. I, I've seen movie orgies, and this is not the, the but this is the movie orgy. Um, and the thing is, because I think he made it when he was like in his twenties, and it's like from the B movie drive-in era of like you know the trailers, those kind of like almost grindhousey, but also with some like children's TV show, you know, kind of whole compilation. I think it may be like six hours, but the problem is that he never actually got like the rights to distribute it for for monetary gain. So uh, he has like a print of it, and I think they showed it at MoMA like ten years ago for like a Joe Dante retrospective. But you can't watch it really, you know, unless uh, you just put together each single clip of, of what he found. Um, you know, you know, so those those are some that just came to mind when I think about the kind of like the Karen Carpenter Barbie doll short film. That's it, exactly for using. You can't the really movie. watch it, but you can if you know where to look. <laughs> yeah, exactly. At least that has been. You know, you don't have to smuggle that with like the Star Wars Christmas special in like a brown paper bag anymore. Yeah. You know, at least YouTube has made a lot of that stuff more accessible. And to be um, clear, by movie orgy, we're not talking about Caligula. No, 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 or or uh, Salo, Salo, or, or none, none of those. There are many films with movie orgies, but this one is actually sexless, from what I from what I've heard. Um, but I, I, yeah, I I feel like it's it's seven hours. I found it's uh, seven hours long. I don't know if anyone has ever watched it from beginning to end. I don't know if you have to, but um, th that that I guess is what I associate with a compilation. Right. documentaries so, well, almost things you can also kind of like come and go like, you can enter when you want and leave you know um right. uh, whereas ken, ken burns which yeah i mean that kind of style for me feels very uh educational i guess not that obviously i'm not putting a negative connotation on education but you know I, like where where it does feel like the kind of thing that is you know primed for class for i don't like you know what i mean is as, as like a textbook sure. in visual form in a lot of ways and of so everybody has like their favorite, of course. Like my friend that loves baseball loves that his baseball one. Um, but it's hard for me sometimes to embrace him as a as a filmmaker outright, um, just because it it seems to be that same kind of thing. And and if it's not a subject I am interested in, it's not. I'm not going to be driven just by Ken Burns' name alone. I guess you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Else. No, I I get that. <clears throat> yeah. Well. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I would probably put he's probably more of a historical documentarian than you know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, painting him into the picture of a compilation film is is maybe yeah. not really articulating what he does, but but yeah, so maybe not the best category for him. Um, so we'll move on to a semi-documentary, which is probably a term that none of you have heard of. <laughs> If you could switch the channel right now, you might do that. But we won't spend that much time on this one. It's a term that's not really around anymore, but it basically means it's a book, film, or television program presented 
in a fictional, presenting a fictional story that incorporates many factual details or events, um, and, but it's presented in a way that's supposed to be similar to a documentary. So one of the first films of this category was The House on 92nd Street from 1945. And, you know, I guess Time Magazine first coined this term semi-documentary uh, in, you know, so, well, I'm sorry, yeah, Time first coined the term semi-documentary in 1952, but I guess they attribute the first one being The House of, on 92nd Street. So knowing we were going to talk about this today, I watched one of the examples that's listed, and that is The Naked City, which is directed by Jules Dassin. Uh, he also has another film that's listed as a semi-documentary called Brute Force with Burt Lancaster. But uh, The Naked City is really, really fantastic if anybody wants to go watch it. I, I liked it a lot. It And it, it, I, I can see why they called it that back then. Now, obviously, to today we would just call it a film <laughs> yeah, yeah. i mean i could see why they they took that term because they wanted to basically separate it from regular films because what it does is basically it's a police procedural you know there's a woman that's murdered and the police have to try and figure out who did it and that on the surface might sound like oh wow you know been there done that but basically what they're trying to do is they're presenting this the story itself is fictional but they're showing you what it's like to be a detective, to be a police officer. You know, there's times when nothing is going on. There's sometimes the step-by-step -step process of solving a crime can be really humdrum and routine. And so those are the documentary elements. And sometimes in this category, they might use non-actors in some of the smaller roles and things like this. Um, but that's basically where the documentary part of it comes in. The bulk of the story is fictional but certain elements that you see in there are, you know, are truthful. And in this case, the producer actually provided the narration for The Naked City, which was interesting. So even his voice sounded very much like a documentary, but I liked it a lot. I know Eric, you told me that you saw it. Right. Yeah, yeah, I have. And, and I kind of, I guess I would associate that in a sense with uh, thinking of other films from that time period, but not in, not in America, like, you know, like when they say Italian neorealism and things of that nature, where it is, again, a fictional narrative, but there are, you know, realistic elements, if you will, or, or and that might come from the casting or that might come from, yeah, using some non-actors or actually hiring a real, I don't know, detective, just to use an example, as, you know, the tech, things like that, where it is almost breaking down some of the the theatricality that's usually associated. And it, it. it kind of goes into hybrid, which is what we talked about in a previous episode. I mean, I feel like the term kind of, uh, it faded because it evolved mm -hmm. over, over, over the years, you know, and, uh, you know, so now you don't really need to call it that anymore. It would be just a film with some hybrid elements to it. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like this, of all the categories that we've spoken about, this one has, you, you really, I, I really have never really heard it before. Four. Um, and, and I feel like it's it's gone very much out, totally out of style, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it faded yeah. in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, and uh, we're so conditioned to like not even, um, if, like you said, if we were to see The Naked City today for the first time, we wouldn't even strike that, you know, that chord that it's uh, documentary adjacent, if you will. Right, if I had not mentioned it and you just watched that movie for the first time, you yeah. would say, oh, you know, it's interesting that the producer's doing the narration, but that might be the only thought that you had occurred to you that was different, you know, in any way. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's another film that's on there, on that list is uh, The Killers, Ernest Hemingway's The Killers. That's also on the Criterion channel. Uh, and like I said, yeah, the style went out of fashion in the 60s and 70s because by that time, uh, you know, the difference between a, a documentary the difference between itself and fiction had kind of blurred so much that, you know, the, the, the term really wasn't, didn't mean anything anymore, but, uh, but yeah, so definitely go see the naked city. If you get a chance. Um, I think, uh, Elliot Kazan has uh, a film on there, panic in the streets. I think it's called. Oh yeah. The new, that's a good one for uh, our current pandemic, uh, I think that's the one that takes place in New Orleans, right? The the yeah, I believe so, yeah. Zero or whatever, and they the the virus or it's being spread. Panic in the streets. I've heard a lot of a lot of people have brought that up in the past six months um, oh, yeah. as being of our time right now. Yeah. 
so yeah, you know, if you get a chance to watch any of those, if you have a subscription to the Criterion channel or you have those movies, you know, give them a shot, see what you think. So we'll move on to silent documentaries. And these are obviously documentaries. Say, this one seems the easiest to at least identify. It is. It is. Hopefully. <laughs> these are obviously documentaries without words. <laughs> they date back to a film called Listen to Britain, which is directed by Humphrey Jennings and Stuart McAllister from 1942. And it's that film is basically, you know, a wordless examination of Britain during wartime. That's, you know, uh, but most famously, this genre is uh, Godfrey Reggio's Katsi trilogy, which, you know, and also the movie Baraka, which, you know, are basically more like poetry documentaries in a way. Um, they have music that's related to the images and, you know, there's no spoken content. I, I own the Criterion box set and I, you know, I recently just watched uh, Koyan Iskatsi, if I pronounced that right. Pretty sure I pronounced that right. And, uh, you know, they're, they're really beautiful films, you know, in, in you look at, in the case of uh, Koyan Iskatsi, it's the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and in the subsequent one, it, I know it's the Southern Hemisphere, but um, they are really filmed in a, you know, just a breathtaking way. Uh, have you seen any of these? I have, yeah, I, I've seen, Part of it, I, I couldn't I couldn't tell you what part or in what capacity, but I was also like in a classroom uh, setting, and I, yeah, I, I mean I enjoy that as well, and I think there's a part of it that, um, you know, when we talk about like observational, you know, with the with the wide net that you have in with that term, uh, I feel like that kind of encompasses a lot of those things and, and, and yeah and, and I do think that there is something to um I guess like there have been some of these that I've seen with like live scores and things of that nature would like which would be typ typical of, of silent films right back right. then and even sometimes still today you'll have silent film screenings with a live uh orchestra um you know and, and that and that definitely does add something to it uh and I, there was even as recently as like the Terrence Malick had a um i think it's like voyage in time voyage of time uh which is sort of like an extension of tree of life but it's a wordless 50 minute um mostly we would call it documentary there's definitely some things that have been enhanced uh after the fact um but would also probably fit in that category of silent wordless etc um and i was also when you're you know describing the definition i was thinking of a director who's pretty like cool, hot right now i guess called victor uh how do i say his last name uh he's from russia victor kosogovsky i guess i think it's uh it's a we'll long a, last name we'll put a display of what is what his e name is exactly uh and he he, uh, he had a really interesting film called Aqu aquarella uh two years ago which was completely wordless and it is the ice uh glaciers um as they are you know sh as these things are shifting as they're melting as they're right. bringing on these giant waves and it's really beautiful and it's something you would also have to see like in a theater and um you know back like in the 90s these were the things that were usually s silent and in like imax right these were like the things that were displayed in imax specifically remember like um earth and all those kind of things um but yeah he seems to work in that style he has a new one out called uh, gunda which is at the New York Film Festival now, which I believe is also completely wordless and um, all documentary, nonfiction shot stuff. So. I'd be interesting to I would be interested to at least check out the the Glacier one. Um, yeah, it's really it's really and there's like a lot of like loud rock music that he scores to it. Uh, so it's like it does pump you up. It's not boring at all. It's not boring. And a guy like dr drives his car across the glacier it, uh, and it it breaks and the car goes like right under. And they got to rush like it. It's exciting. It's exciting. It's not a. It's not a boring uh, sit at all. So it's definitely. And checking. what you were commenting on boring that kind of reminded me. And like the Katsi trilogy, they're certainly not boring. Now I don't know mm -hmm. if it would be the type of movie you would select for a Saturday night movie night at the house. Yeah. But you know, when we were talking before about educational films and films we would watch in class, I can certainly picture some of the teachers I've had in the past throwing this on during social studies. 
and being like, okay, here, watch this. And, you know, you just kind of sit there and you take it all in. And it's really beautiful. Now, if you're watching class, obviously you're not going to be conditioned to be excited. But, um, you know, it's uh, – they're they are great, you know, great-looking films that I would recommend – People. Yeah, and, and I do think they are, like, they are important. Yeah, and I, I remember they had reissued Baraka, maybe like there was an anniversary, maybe in the past five years. That was a big one, and I think they were doing like seventy millimeter screenings again, where again it was all about seeing it big, you know, seeing it projected on a very large screen to really be a part of that. So that's that's also a very big part of these uh, their their theatrical lives, you know. Yeah, absolutely, like, and I I feel like I've been to museums where they might have shown. Yeah. Island documentaries as well, like just kind of watching animals in their element or, you know, the oceans, whatever. So the style, it, it, it does appear, you know, and now and then. Um, and like you were talking about observational documentaries. And you know what? We could just kind of shift into that one. Uh, observational documentaries simply attempt to spontaneously observe, live, you know, a, a lived life with a minimum of intervention. And that's kind of where, you know, the minimum of intervention thing gets into arguments that we brought up in the past, which is, you know, life has to be affected to a certain extent by the entrance of a filmmaker and a camera. So there's obviously a lot. It's a wide net, as you already said. And I don't know if this gentleman would be considered an in this genre or not, but we haven't talked about him. So we'll talk about him now. And that's Frederick Wiseman. He's obviously... A, uh, a a very famous uh, you know and respected documentarian and his films are not very easy to find but uh he certainly goes into an element and certainly observes now on the ha on the other hand though he has fully admitted that he manipulates his footage to a certain extent to tell a story so eric knowing yeah. the term observational documentaries would you put him in that category I, I would, and and I think because in his uh, scenario, like most of his films are also like at least three hours, uh, and, and you're like, okay, like he has a brand new one out called City Hall, which is about Boston City Hall. Right. Uh, he lives in Massachusetts, and I think part of the reason why it's hard to see some of his films is because like he has like his own company that is like the one who like sells the films. Like they never, you know, they don't get purchased for distribution by these larger, there's not a lot of market value for, for Frederick Wiseman films, but, um, but yeah, like thinking of uh, one recently, I saw Monrovia, Indiana, which is about this small city in Indiana. And like, he really loves like um, local town meetings and things like that. And you'll be in there. An avid C-SPAN watcher. He, well, he might be. It might be and, uh, another one that is fascinating though is uh, at Berkeley, which is at the university, and like, but you are in these meetings that are that can get really really intense. But you're in there for like 25 minutes, and like he'll be, he may have two cameras. He might be toggling a little bit, but, but I mean, it's not. We're sticking there, you know. We're staying there, right. and, and and if you're in the right mood, like it is fascinating, uh, and you you do kind of want the that. right mood. <laughs> In the right, you know, like if you're looking for conflict, conflict, or like some kind of, you know, there's, there's not, there's not a uh, th narrative through line that's necessarily going to be, you know, taking you a certain way. Uh, I can imagine couples going through this debate when they want to watch a movie. Should we watch a horror movie tonight? No, I got one. How about City Hall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, if, if you want to know about, you know, these like the the mudslinging, uh, taxation raising, uh, you know, hey, if you're again, like if you're in the right mood, like. Uh, he made one about Madison Square Garden, and there's actually a cameo, quote unquote cameo, by Stone Cold because there was a WWF house show. Uh, it's not like Stone Cold is like participating in the documentary, uh, but you know you, you don't think you don't think he got a cut? Yeah, well, yeah, oh yeah. The, the, well, you know it's funny because of some rights issues for that. That's one that actually never was released. You had to like I found it like a BitTorrent or something like that. Um, but but yeah, and, and he's definitely someone. The filmmaker is. I, I actually got to interview him uh, once, and I, I was I was really excited. He's like now he's like ninety three, um, right. and but I was very intimidated because he is somebody who like is like oh what made you like choose to shoot like this scene where you're gonna? He's like, well, camera was there, and uh, you know <laughs> they were there, and you know he's like he's completely plain speak about that kind of stuff. uncomplicated kind of yeah, right to the point yeah. Totally. So, so he's not looking for any artistic, 
uh, you know, verbiage about how to describe his craft. Um, but he, you know, he, he makes them and has a very small, it's usually at the film forum every year when his new one comes out. And that's pretty, you know, a few festivals as well, but that's as wide as the reach goes. But observational, I think is the right term. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, you were saying, you know, obviously his movies are, you know, they'll be in the city for a time, uh, depending on what the festival is, but they are hard to find. And like, I have, there's been times in the past where I think to myself, you know, I'm really going to, I'm going to go and I'm going to seek out one of his movies and I'm going to watch it. And then it just, you know, they are a commitment, much like Ken Burns documentaries are to us. Yeah. You know, like there's some of his that I haven't watched yet because they are a commitment. Like you have to, as Eric said, be in a certain mood. <laughs> yeah. It, and, I, and one thing I think is important about documentaries in general too, but then with Ken Burns, how so many people, how Ken Burns is a celebrity kind of onto himself, I guess too, is that like, thanks to a lot of like public funding and things like that, his films do get a wide audience by being usually on PBS or, PBS, or yeah. another public funded thing where, where a lot of documentary films obviously don't have that opportunity or, or right. they may get the independent lens on PBS, on the ITBS Monday night stuff. But Ken Burns films always have a pretty wide um, telecast um, you know, screen. Usually TV is where you find a Ken Burns movie for the first time, you know? Um, and so I think that is also part of his popularity is the accessibility, right? And it's sure, a big absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, no doubt. All right. So I think the last one that we haven't really talked about is just a travel documentary. And there's really not much to say here. Obviously, it, it could be a film, a television program, or even an online series that describes travel in general or tourist attractions without really recommending, you know, certain package deals you know they might not represent a company you know a travel agency mm -hmm. but you know they're not tour operators but they're just uh showing you what these places are like and like i've certainly seen a lot of television series that do this kind of thing uh one that i really like a lot is called an idiot abroad which uh, is from you know ricky gervais and his friend carl pilkington and they send him to various places and you know he's an interesting fellow and like they basically just watch him go to these different places and give his thoughts. Uh, Michael Palin has, you know, had, a, you know, a, basically had a second career doing stuff like this around the world in 80 days. Um, so that, there's really not much to say here. But Eric, what do you think? Have you ever watched any travel documentaries? Uh, I can't think of any like features that that come to mind in that regard like yeah i think usually like as you were saying they kind of come with like a additional hook most of the time uh as in it's food related or, or whatever you know things that get people to be traveling all over in the you know all over the the world um i couldn't really think of any films that would necessarily you know, match that criteria. Um, okay. That's not, yeah, subsidized by the island or wherever they are, you know, itself as as meant as some kind of commercialized tourism thing. Um, yeah, I can't I can't think of a, a a film I would associate with that. Yeah, and I should add that this uh, kind of got started like it was called the, a travelogue, and it was used. You know, the early 19th century, they basically used this to these types of documentaries to show people what other countries were like you know so it it was that's how people got to see what people in other cultures how they acted and what those places yeah. look like yeah but and there are definitely there are definitely things that do have like a journalistic side like i think like chantelle ackerman the french filmmaker who uh news from home and like documentaries that incorporate you know a foreign place she may be living in or she's writing letters to her mother and they're she's living in New York and but it's not but I, I wouldn't associate I mean the place the the location is very important but it's not I guess in the same uh it doesn't have the same agenda I guess as what that what the description sounds like right that's closest well so we'll wrap up our talk on documentaries here just giving some final thoughts so, you know thinking about all these terms I would just say that Obviously, documentaries as a whole genre is much more complicated than what everybody might think. There are a lot of different types of documentaries, and I do think it is important to have them, you know, distinct from each other. You know, in some cases, I think it's important, you know, that they're not just painted with one, oh, this is just documentaries, because, you know, we expect certain things from documentaries. If you say Michael Moore is making a documentary, you would expect 
something different than if you were watching one from Ken Burns or Frederick Wiseman. So, but at the same time, there's a lot of these terms as we've explored that really don't mean much and are coined by critics or magazine writers or even sometimes the filmmakers themselves to kind of paint the effort that they've made in a artistic light or in a unique light to kind of separate it. And in reality, it's either just a documentary or it's a film that might use some documentary elements. You could call it hybrid, I guess, if you want, but it's just a film. So what do you think, Eric? Any final thoughts on documentaries? Um, I, I guess, yeah, I think one of the that you just touched on is that so we have so many of these descriptions and I guess these, these terms because uh, you're right that when people, it's, it's, it's primarily a reason to, to market documentaries, I guess, right? Like, yeah, you're right that like Michael Moore is probably, Ken Burns, Michael Moore are probably the two most mainstream, I would I guess, probably the two most mainstream names that people would associate with documentaries, right? Um, remember when Fahrenheit 9-11 was like such a huge thing? Yeah. Uh, um, and and so when it comes to like, oh, well, is this, what kind of documentary is this? What does it play with it? You know, I, I do think it's a little bit tougher when you are trying to sell to a general audience or to a larger audience because they're associating it usually with pol political opinions, I guess, or, you know, a political point of view and it's going to be this, you know, those tend to be the, the biggest documentaries, successful financially documentaries that we have, even the, uh, the, I don't really consider him a documentary filmmaker, but uh, Dinesh D'Souza is the right wing. Uh, he, he does every four years. He does like Obama's America, Hillary's America. But right. anyway, if they were elected, you'd see people dying in the streets, whatever. Uh, you know, but they they do they do well, and they officially count, I guess, as documentaries. And so he does have some of the top grossing documentaries of the past twenty years. Um, you know, so it does in order to break out from just having that image of what documentaries are in the mainstream i feel like these these extra categories can help but it is harder to bring in people then at the same time you know i ended like by breaking it down more you're you're hopefully explaining it better to people but right. hopefully you're also not like dissuading them from coming in the first place. right true yeah yeah and uh, you know we managed to make it through all these shows without talking about march of the penguins or oh, even yeah. disney yeah. nature series yeah. documentaries which i don't know i guess they're just you would just describe them as regular documentaries or you know even i mean they're observational to a certain extent um but certainly it's disney they, so they edit yeah. it in a way that puts a story to it so even like, what about uh, like inconvenient truth what do we call that a powerpoint documentary uh, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah good enough yeah educational I, I like that powerpoint documentaries that's uh, <laughs> I, I'm oh, going to bring back semi-documentary. I'm bringing that back into the lexicon. I tell you, nothing sounds more exciting than going to see the, the new PowerPoint documentary. It sounds... <laughs> I never saw the uh, follow-up that he did. Oh, I didn't either. I, I didn't meant either. to. Um, I, bet I, it was, actually, I, I reviewed it was the first one before one won, but... Yeah, I, have, yeah I, I, I forgot about that, actually. What, what was it even called? An, an even more inconvenient truth? Or? <laughs> well, I think it was um, called An Inconvenient Truth to Electric Boogaloo. Oh, oh, it's called it's Inconvenient Truth, Believe Us Now, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Pretty much with that one, you did have two pe two types of people. People that were interested in hearing what he had to say, and people were just, I'm not watching a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I, I was so disappointed when that I think, like won the Academy Award, and I watched it, and I'm just like, this is not a... Like, it's, I guess we technically would call it a documentary, but it's it's pretty much his speech, his lecture, it's Don't. one of those hot topic yeah. documentaries at the time. Yeah. And, you know, we're not going to get too far into the weeds here, but the Academy yeah. is notorious for awarding whatever hot topic documentaries are out. They don't do that all the time. But in his case, whether you like that movie or not, it had such a full head of steam when it yeah. was out that there was no stopping it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, thank you for taking this journey through documentaries with us. We are going to go to the opposite of that for our next show. We're going to get into... Uh, <laughs> Fakest movies. Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get into Italian neorealism next week. <laughs> what are the movies that are the most fake and the most acted and the most written? Cinema we Verite. Know. We're going to do two hours on cinema. Um, but no. Yeah. yeah. So we are going to talk about some horror and some Halloween-related things. So stay tuned. We thank you for joining us. 
Tom thanks you as well. We will see you next week.